Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, where we'll be discussing contemporary tools and methods for interpreting splice variants in hereditary cancer. My name is Candace Chapman, and I'll be your host. So let's get started. As most of you know, Mastermind is the most comprehensive source of genomic evidence and can be used to quickly identify and review papers for patient diagnosis and treatment decisions. In today's webinar, our guest speaker from Myriad Genetics will discuss the multifaceted approach that brings together RNA analysis, functional evidence in the literature, published clinical cases, and other methods to classify splice variants. She will share how to facilitate the clustering of publications for variants that share a common mechanism, and how a critical review of all available evidence is crucial for interpreting splice variants. We're really excited to hear this presentation. Uh, but first, here are just a few quick housekeeping notes. Today's presentation will include some professional edition features of Mastermind, which are necessary for clinical variant interpretation and reporting. If you don't already have a Mastermind account, you can create one today by using the bit.ly link you see on the screen. And uh, that link will also be dropped in the chat window. This will start you with a free trial of Mastermind Pro, so definitely take advantage of that. If you're joining us live, feel free to drop your questions into the Q&A as they occur to you, and we'll get to those toward the end of the talk today. If we run out of time for all the questions, we'll follow up with you after the event. Today's webinar is being recorded, and a link will be emailed to you to review or share after we wrap. So now, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, Dr. Randy Rawson from Myriad Genetics. Hi, Randy. Randy is a clinical genomic scientist who works on variant classification and reclassification for Myriad's oncology products, alongside a diverse team of scientists, genetic counselors, and lab directors. And prior to joining Myriad, Randy completed her PhD in postdoctoral training at the University of Utah. And we're also joined by Genomenon's field application scientist and mastermind expert, Denise Philandres. Hi, Denise. You may be familiar with Denise because she leads our Mastermind support and training programs. Denise is going to kick us off with a quick overview of Mastermind. But before that, I just wanted to point out that Denise has um, just published an excellent blog on the best strategies for searching SNVs and ways to get optimal results. And you can find the blog on our website at genomenon.com backslash blog after the presentation. Denise, take it away. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Candice. Excited to be here. Um, I'm going to show a few slides so that everyone can get a quick intro of how Mastermind works, what the user interface looks like, and understand how Mastermind is displaying non-coding variants like splice variants, which is, of course, our topic today. Here on this slide, you can see all the kinds of genomic concepts that can be searched in Mastermind. You can think of Mastermind as being an associations engine just as much as it is a search engine for literature. So we take in information like genes and variants, then that can be linked across to other concepts like phenotypes and therapies. So there are uh, a number of ways to filter the results that are returned to you to help you prioritize the articles that are going to be relevant for you. Uh, for example, you might want to see functional studies or case reports and there are filters to help prioritize uh, those types of papers. So in that way, Mastermind really specializes in finding and uh, connecting genomic concepts. Next slide, please, Candice. So here we have a screenshot of the Mastermind user interface, or UI, uh, after launching a search for uh, a gene and a variant. So I have a splice variant here in my search bar. Randy is going to show a few screenshots herself, but I want to cover this broadly so we can follow along when she does present them. Uh, at the top of the screen, you'll find our integration with ClinVar, as well as information about related variants. And then below that, there are four panes where we display information on uh, variants and articles. So next slide, please. 
Here we're uh, zoomed in on uh, the left side of the screen, which is focused on variants. So all the published variants are displayed in a Manhattan plot. So that's that variant diagram here. And below that, those variants are shown in a list or table format. Since I searched uh, a splice variant in this example, you can see it highlighted in blue and then also boxed in green on this slide. So notice how it's designated in this table as N2543SA. So SA stands for splice acceptor. <clears throat> and this is the splice acceptor site adjacent to the amino acid at residue 2543. So Mastermind is treating that splice acceptor site as a group of variants that occur at the minus one or minus two position relative to that uh, exon. So it's not just one specific nucleotide change. On the next slide, Candice, if you may. So these are the different groups of non-coding variants that Mastermind will sort of bucket together. Um, when we say bucket, we mean, for example, if you search for a variant, like C.123 minus 1 G to A. That would fall on the SA or splice acceptor bucket. <clears throat> For that search, you would get articles returned to you about that exact, you know, minus 1 G to A change, but also articles mentioning changes um, at that same position, like minus 1 G to C. Um, and also changes at the uh, minus two position, because those are the two uh, positions that make up that splice acceptor site and the SA bucket. <clears throat> so, you know, the idea being if you're looking at a variant in the splice acceptor and maybe there are no articles about that exact variant, you may also be interested in seeing uh, articles about other variants that might affect splicing in a similar way. Uh, next slide, please. So since there are multiple variants that might fall into one of these buckets, you, you need to know when an article contains you know, the exact change that you searched for versus some other variant that's in that bucket, right? So we denote these articles um, by adding that crosshair symbol that you can see in the green box next to the article uh, within the articles list. Um, so when you click on an article with that symbol, you can expect to find the exact nucleotide change you searched for uh, in that article. And you can look at the sentence fragments to see that. So specifically the column uh, where it says matched, um, you're gonna see the nomenclature that was actually used in that paper. So that's what's shown there um, below the articles list in the full text matches section. Next slide, please. So articles that have the, the crosshair symbol are prioritized and they appear uh, toward the top or first on that article's list. Um, so when we scroll down toward the bottom of that list, you'll eventually see some articles without that crosshair symbol. So here I'm all the way down at the bottom of the articles list. You can see those two papers at the top. They have that crosshair symbol, but right below that in uh, the red box is kind of empty space. So those articles don't have that uh, symbol. So when you click on one of those articles, you won't expect to find uh, an exact nucleotide match mentioned in that paper, but you uh, can instead find uh, mention of some variant in that bucket. So right now we're, we're talking about the SA bucket. So at the bottom um, under the full text matches uh, section here um, is where you will find that we found a match for a different variant at the same position. So we had originally searched um, minus two A to C, but here we have a match for minus two A to G. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, the, the presence or absence of that crosshair symbol will tell you whether the exact variant is found in that article. And with that, I will hand it off to Randy for her presentation. Okay. Oh, yeah, thank you so much to Denise, Candice, and Kate for the invitation for this webinar. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you all today about interpreting splice variants. And um, this is all kind of from, as been mentioned, I work at Mirror Genetics and I work on the oncology team. So the, the entirety of the talk is very much from an oncology perspective. 
So at, at Marion Genetics, we're committed to helping patients understand their risk for hereditary cancer. And um, with the MyRisk hereditary cancer test, uh, we can evaluate 48 different genes that have been associated with 11 different cancer sites. And this allows patients to uh, understand what kind of health risks they have. So if you look at the wheel on the left, uh, this is outlining the 11 different cancer sites. And so you can see some of them are like renal, breast, gastric, for example. And the number on the outside of the circle is referring to the general population risk for each of those cancer types. Whereas the number on the inside of the circle is referencing the lifetime risk for an individual who has a mutation in a gene that has increased risk for one of these cancer sites. So for example, uh, renal cancer, patients with a mutation in one of our genes associated with renal cancer have up to a 70% lifetime risk of developing renal cancer compared to only 1.7% in the general population. Or in the case of breast cancer, it's up to 87% if you have a mutation compared to 12.9% in the general population. So as you can see, these, these have huge impacts on patients' lives and having this information helps patients mitigate their risks when possible and they can more proactively manage their medical care. So as you can imagine, because of the, the importance of this information and the kind of decisions that patients are making based on this information, it's really critical that variants identified in hereditary cancer genes are classified accurately. Uh, at Myriad, we are classifying variants based on modified ACMG guidelines, as well as available evidence. We use multiple lines of evidence for classification, and it's really important that the data is critically assessed and integrated. In support of that effort, uh, we rely on a diverse team of experts to um, classify variants. So we're, we're relying on genetic counselors, variant specialists, PhD level scientists, lab directors, and this team of, of people is involved every single day in the assessment and classification of variants. But for today, I am going to focus on the classification of splicing variants in particular. So splicing variants make up about 10 to 15% of pathogenic variants, and they present some unique challenges to the classification process, and so to address those needs, we employ some specific tools uh, to assess them. So for example, uh, relying on computational splice prediction and RNA analysis to help uh, understand these variants. In addition, we look at literature in some ways that are specific for splicing variants. So at a single junction, uh, multiple variants may share a common mechanism. And so it's important to assess the literature for similar variants and Luckily, Mastermind really makes that process seamless. So to highlight some of these unique considerations and tools for classifying splicing variants, I'm going to go over three variant case studies. Uh, the first one will be an STK11 variant that highlights the power of Mastermind. And the second one will be an APC variant and the third uh, BRCA2 variant. Both the second and third variants are great examples of the, important, the importance of properly assessing RNA data. And then the third is additionally an example of using clinical data to classify a splicing variant. So let's jump into the first variant case study, which is for SDK11 C.597 plus 1 G to A. Uh, this is, again, it's a great example of the power of Mastermind for quickly gathering all the relevant literature for splice variants like these. So to start out, just a little bit about STK11. So, um, of course, it's a hereditary cancer risk gene. So individuals with STK11 have a condition called Putz-Jeghers syndrome, or PJS. And this 
condition is characterized by hamartomous gastrointestinal polyps that have a distinctive Kutz-Jaeger histology. Um, so this is a, a unique disorder and it can be identified by histology. So you can find patients in the literature that are specific to this PJS phenotype. Um, in, a, in addition to those polyps, especially in childhood, individuals with this condition have pigmented spots um, at various parts of their body, for example, mouth, eyes, um, et cetera. So in addition to having uh, PJS, if an individual has a mutation in STK11, we also know that they have increased risk of cancer across multiple sites. So some of the most common being colorectal, pancreatic, breast, and gastric cancer. So let's get into this variant that we're talking about today, C.597 plus 1 G to A. This variant is at the donor site of exon 4. Uh, so it's abolishing the donor site, and exon skipping is predicted, uh, is the predicted outcome of, of having this variant. So if exon 4 is skipped, uh, it's going to create a frame shift because as you can see here, the flanking sequences on exon 3 and exon 5 are not compatible with each other. So an extra base will be introduced, causing a frame shift and a premature truncation. If we look at, if we look for this variant in Mastermind, so here's a, a screenshot of the Mastermind, Mastermind website. And you can see here, I've searched for STK11, C.597 plus 1 G to A. And then we have our article section and our full text max matches section. So you can see, as Denise uh, mentioned earlier, um, there is this uh, target symbol, bullseye target symbol, which is telling us that it's an exact match for the variant I searched for. So this is an exact match for the plus one G to A. Um, and these, as Denise mentioned, these are prioritized. So they're sitting at the top of the list. There's 15 articles total um, that come up for this plus one G to A variant. And the exact matches are at the top. So I've clicked on uh, this particular one. And you can see in the full text match section that it's telling me exactly what variant uh, mastermind identified in the paper. And so I can verify, yep, that's that's the variant I'm interested in. Um, and then I can also see that this is from a paper by Pap et al. Uh, 2010. So we can quickly gather the lit that is exactly matching to my variant of interest. And so in this case, the the variant was found in a mother and daughter who both had PJS in the Pap et al. 2010 paper. So we have one uh, PGS paper, 4 plus 1 to G, G to A, with some segregation when I'm in a mother and daughter. But one of the great things about Mastermind is uh, this bucketing that Denise talked about. So not only is Mastermind showing me the, the papers that have the plus 1 G to A, which was 4 in this particular case, but Mastermind's also returning to me all the finds for variants at the splice donor site or SD. And so the splice donor site is going to include any change at plus one and plus two. So these changes are for the most part typically going to have the same mechanism as each other. So they're always of interest and they're so easy to gather all that critical information and help us a proper properly assess um, these donor variants or acceptor and in other cases. So they're bucketing them all together, um, 15 total. And so now I've highlighted here, I'm on a paper, you'll notice it no longer has that bullseye exact match. So I already know when I click on it that this paper probably is not going to have my plus one G to A. Um, but instead, this one has a plus two T to A in the paper. And um, I just want to kind of expand this full text match section because I just want to show uh, some of the advantages to this full text match section. So this particular paper is Orlana um, 2012, 
And so if we zoom in on the full text match section, uh, you can see, again, that the variant in the paper is the plus 2 T to A. And here, Mastermind is showing us direct fragment text fragments from the paper. So this is literally what's in the, in the paper. I don't even have to click and open it yet. I just have immediate access to some really uh, quick information. And so I see the variant, and I can also quickly see, hey, this variant looks like it's probably in a PJS patient or family in this paper. And so just quickly clicking through the Mastermind website, I immediately know this Oralana 2012 paper is of very high interest to me, and I should prioritize it during my um, analysis process. So we have our, for this, for the patient data for this variant so far, we have our, our one find for the plus one G to A, which was found in a mother and daughter with PJS. And then when we combine variants at the splice donor junction, we end up finding two additional patients. So there isn't a PGS patient in that Oralana 2012 paper, 2013 paper, sorry. Um, and there's a plus one G to T in a child with PJS in Zhang et al. 2019 as well. So importantly, all three of these variants are predicted to have the same splice impact. So they're all abolishing that donor site. None of them is like creating a cryptic or doing something else, you know, they all have the same splice prediction. And so this literature can be combined, giving us three, a total of three PGS finds, um, plus that little bit of segregation in the PAP paper as well. So this was enough for us to upgrade the variant from our default suspected deleterious to deleterious. For the next case study, uh, we'll look at this APC missense variant um, and discuss data from Myriad's RNA lab. So APC is associated with familial adenomatous polyposis syndrome, or FAP. Um, alternatively, it can also be found in patients with an attenuated phenotype or attenuated FAP, AFAP. Um, both of these conditions are characterized by large numbers of adenomous polyps, polyps in the GI system, uh, particularly the colon, rectum, stomach, and small bowel. And then individuals with mutations in APC also have increased cancer risk across multiple sites, uh, but in particular, uh, colorectal cancer. So this variant uh, that we're discussing today is super interesting because there's actually not an obvious splice um, defect for this variant at first uh, review, first glance. So it is a missense variant, um, C.1902 T to G, and it's not creating a cryptic site. It's not, it's not impacting any of the native donors, et cetera, acceptors. And so it, it wasn't going to be an obvious splice variant. Um, and it's located in Exxon, 14 of APC. But I'm about to show you that there is actually lit for this variant showing that uh, this variant seems to be uh, causing exon 14 skipping. So again, you can see that if exon 14 is skipped uh, and exon 13 and 15 are spliced together, those flanking sequences are not compatible with each other and a frame shift would be created. So in the literature, uh, which can, you know, we can, you can find this literature in Mastermind. Uh, it's been observed that there's a loss of exon 14 in both patient RNA sample as well as in a mini gene assay in Grandfall et al. 2014. And importantly, the paper didn't cover um, enough information for us to know whether uh, this was a, a complete or a partial splice defect. So there was no allele specific quantification. And so in other words, uh, we don't know whether the mutant allele could still produce some normal mRNA product. So this could be a partial splicing defect. So since we don't know um, the severity of the splicing defect, we classify this variant as uncertain and requested an RNA sample. So before 
uh, we did get a sample and we were able to analyze this variant, but before I, I jump into that data, I first just wanna let you know, like, what do I mean by allele specific quantification and why is it so important? So here, if you look at this mock gel, uh, we have a control sample and a patient sample. And you can see that in both samples, we have an upper band that is representing a full length or a normal transcript, if you will. And then the patient sample has an additional smaller band that in this case, for example, would represent exon 14 skipping. So the real, um, the thing we don't know is whether the splicing defect is partial or complete. And, or more importantly, what we really wanna know is whether the mutant allele can produce any normal mRNA. So we really want to we really want to know what's going on here, what's going on in the patient sample with the full length transcript. If if the variant causes a complete uh, splice defect, then we would expect to see only the wild type or T allele present in the full length transcripts. Alternatively, if the variant causes a partial splicing defect, then perhaps we might see something where um, most of the full length transcript is coming from the wild type T allele, but um, there's a some very minor contribution of the mutant allele to that full length transcript. Another option is that we could have a partial splice defect where the mutant allele is actually contributing a significant portion of the of the full length transcript. So here you can see it's, it's not quite half, but it's a large chunk of that full length transcript is coming from the mutant allele or the, the G allele. So it's really important to figure out which of these scenarios is going on. And we can't, we can't tell which of these scenario, scenarios is happening just by looking at the gel um, or a chromatogram. And so we need to know this because based on which of these scenarios is actually at play, uh, it can result in very different clinical outcomes for a patient. So as I mentioned, we did get an RNA sample uh, for this variant and we, our internal RNA lab was able to analyze it. So they did observe skipping of exon 14, exactly what uh, Granval et al. saw. And you can see here, this is just a chromatogram from wild type transcript from the patient. And you can see that there's a very minor, um, like a little blip representing the G allele. So we are seeing some representation of the G allele in the wild type transcript. Uh, but importantly, our RNA lab was able to do allele specific quantification. So they did dilution limited PCR, and they were able to sequence hundreds of individual alleles. And based on that data, we were able to determine that only 2% of the full length transcript was produced by the mutant allele. So in other words, this variant has a near complete splice defect. So not only do we have the splice defect, but there are also some clinical cases in the literature so this variant has been found in a Swedish FAP patient in Roland et al. 2016. Uh, this variant, this particular family also actually had an, um, another uncertain APC in cis with the C.1902 T to G. But then there was an additional patient uh, in Granval et al. 2014 that was found um, in the French FAP registry. So taking the near complete splice defects, together with some clinical cases in the literature, we were able to upgrade the variant from uncertain to suspected deleterious. For the last variant case study, uh, we'll talk about BRCA2 C.426 minus 12 to 426 minus 8 del. Um, this variant is a great example of why it is so important to assess the completeness of the splicing defect. And ultimately, we were actually able to classify this variant based on multiple pieces of strong clinical data rather than uh, splice data. So I'm sure as most of you all know, BRCA2 is associated with hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, or HBOC. Um, in addition, there's also uh, 
biallelic loss of BRC2 can um, sometimes cause Fanconi anemia. So biallelic loss can be lethal, but when not lethal, it's uh, generally it causes Fanconi anemia. And this is this is a disorder that's typically diagnosed very early, so in childhood or adolescence, and it's characterized by physical abnormalities, stunted growth, progressive bone marrow failure, and early onset cancers. So as you can tell, it's it's pretty distinctive. It's it's identified early. Uh, it's well characterized. Um, and this will come, FA will come back into the discussion in a few slides, so uh, that's why I bring it up here. And then, again, of course, if a mutation in BRCA2 is going to be associated with cancer risk across multiple sites, not just breast ovarian, there's also increased risk for pancreatic or male breast cancer and prostate cancer. So this variant is at the acceptor site, and it's it's deleting five bases within the what's called the pyrimidine tract. So here you can see the acceptor site is labeled in green, and this variant is in the intron flanking exon five, and it's deleting these five bases that are highlighted in magenta. So the important part of this portion of the acceptor site is that it needs to be as pyrimidine rich as possible to help draw in the splice machinery. So here we're deleting four pyrimidines, and then as a result, in the mutant sequence below, you can see that there's quite a few more purines being pulled in close to the acceptor site. This kind of um, mutation is, is known to weaken acceptor sites, and so sometimes it's not enough to fully weaken the site and it can still splice, and other times this is really a severe blow to the acceptor site. Um, and predictions can kind of give you an indication of, of how severe this might be, but it really requires RNA analysis to, to truly know how severe of a defect a deletion like this might cause. Um, so variant is in exon 5. If we were to skip exon 5, that would again create a frame shift. So as you can see, the flanking sequences in exon 4 and exon 6 are not compatible with each other, and we would have a frame shift and a premature truncation. There is actually um, multiple studies showing a splice defect for this variant. Um, and Skipping of exon 5 is what has been repeatedly observed. I won't, in the interest of time, I won't go into all the studies that are out there, but I will just highlight one study in particular uh, from Zhang et al. 2009, where they did RNA analysis on a patient sample. So they originally amplified across exons 3 to 7, and they observed two bands in the patient sample. Um, and then the, the single full-length transcript in the control, they were, from based on sequencing, they were able to determine that this lower band was coming from uh, the loss of exon 5, which is shown here in their representative chromatogram. Um, but luckily, they, did, they didn't stop there. They took the analysis one step further. And they did a nice experiment where they did another amplification, but this time they spanned the amplification from exons 4 to exons 10. And the reason why they did that is because this patient had a heterozygous variant located in exon 10. So if they could capture exon 10, they were able to distinguish the two alleles um, from each other because because this is an intronic variant, we, we become blind to which allele it is on once we're looking at uh, cDNA and mRNA product. So they bring it out to exon 10, and then they, they cloned their RT-PCR products into a vector, and they were able to isolate 10 colonies that had exon 5 inclusion. So in other words, they're isolating 10 colonies that had normal transcript. And then from, from those 10 colonies, six of them had the wild type allele, and four of the colonies had the mutant allele. In other words, they're basically observing that 40% of normal transcript is being generated by the mutant allele. So that's a, that's a 
pretty massive contribution from this uh, mutant allele that normally we would have thought might have a pretty severe splice defect. This data is indicating, no, the splice defect might not actually be that severe at all. Uh, so because this partial splicing defect was observed, we classified the variant as uncertain. Uh, with time, we've been able to use uh, clinical data to uh, reclassify this variant. So at Myriad, we used a, a tool called the History Weighting Algorithm, or HWA. And this tool is basically analyzing personal and family history of breast and ovarian cancer. And then it's comparing our variant of interest against known pathogenics and known benign controls. And this tool has been validated. So it's been shown to be greater than 99.5% accurate. And in the case of this particular variant, our tool is calling it benign. So you can see that uh, data shown here. So this red curve is representing our pathogenic controls. And the teal curve is representing our benign controls. And now our variant today, the minus 12 to minus 8 del, is represented by this line. So you can see that the personal and family history um, of individuals with today's variant basically looks exactly like those of other, of other individuals who have known benign variants in BRCA2. So with this, uh, it's very strong evidence that this is, variant is in fact benign, but we even had more clinical data than this. So we've also seen the variant co-occur with other pathogenic variants. So we have found this variant in trans or on the opposite allele of two pathogenic variants uh, in two patients. And importantly, so if you remember everything I mentioned about FA earlier, childhood onset, pretty severe uh, disorder, the, these patients that, where we found the in trans with pathogenic variants, those patients were um, coming to us at middle age um, at the time of testing and they had no features suggestive of Fanconi anemia. So this is really strong evidence that this variant is not pathogenic. If the variant were pathogenic, these individuals would have um, some indication of Fanconi anemia by the time they were coming to us for testing, and instead these patients are, are pretty healthy. So if we combine our co-occurrence finds with our history weighting algorithm, we were able to reclassify this variant from uncertain to benign. And really, I think the overall important message with this variant is I think it really highlights the importance of being cautious when interpreting splicing data. It's important to note that most published splicing data does not include allele-specific quantification. So that was a really, um, that Zhang paper was really great that they did that further analysis, but unfortunately, so often when we're looking at splicing variants in the literature, we don't get that level of information. So when it's not there, it's really important to be cautious um, and consider whether there could be a partial or complete splicing defect. And then importantly, once a partial splicing defect has been identified, it really, necessitates having clinical data to understand whether that partial defect is deleterious or not. So sometimes partial defects can be insufficient uh, to prevent cancer risk and other partial splicing defects are, you know, are very minor and there's no clinical impact to them. So it really requires getting clinical data to answer the question of is this partial defect benign or deleterious. So with that, I'll just summarize um, everything that I've talked about today so far. So we're using multiple tools and lines of evidence to interpret splicing variants, and we're um, sometimes using these tools in unique ways, specifically for uh, the context of a splice variant. So for example, with literature, uh, we are really, uh, we really appreciate the benefits of Mastermind for clustering those splice variants together, making it so quick and easy and efficient for us to gather the important literature for these variants. 
And then again, just a note of caution when interpreting splicing data in the literature that often, you know, whether the defect is complete or partial is not assessed. And so just to take some of it with uh, a grain of salt and kind of consider whether, whether there should be concern that a defect could in fact be partial. For clinical data, we have a lot of options. There's clinical cases, there's our history weighting algorithm, co-occurrences, segregation, and all of this data is so important in assessing splice variance. Again, because as I mentioned just a minute ago, it's, it's really difficult to know whether a partial defect is in fact problematic or not. And we really are relying on that clinical data to, to point us in the right direction. For uh, computational splice predictions, this is a really useful screening tool. So it's, it's identifying variants of interest. And as part of that prediction process, it's also really important to assess the impact on the tra transcript. So today, all of my examples were exons where if the exon was skipped, you would get a frame shift and a premature truncation. But of course, other exons, um, that might not necessarily be the case. And so then you have to kind of do a deeper dive into the transcript and protein domains to understand um, if I, you know, severely impair a splice site in this exon, is it still likely to be uh, deleterious or not? So uh, that part's always always fun, but it, it is just a screening tool and a prediction process and not, um, not a method of classification on its own. And then lastly and most importantly is RNA analysis. So Myriad has an internal RNA lab and um, we always stress the importance of doing allele specific quantification and um, yeah, so I think again, we've kind of beaten that to death, but <laughs> the importance of not understanding how much of the wild type transcript is being generated by the mutant allele. So again, we're taking all these different tools and combining them to lead to accurate variant classifications for splicing variants. So with that, I uh, just thank you all for coming and attending the webinar. Um, a huge thank you to Candice, Denise, and Kate. I would say um, working with Mastermind during variant curation is wonderful, but it's also just so wonderful every time I work with the people team at Genomenon. It's such a great team of people, and I really appreciate everything that they do for us. And everything, all the different tools and resources that they provide us. So thank you all so much. And with that, I'll hand it back to Candice for the Q&A section. Wow, Randy, thank you. Um, and we do have an awesome team. I um, love working with you. Um, so thank you so much for the excellent presentation. Um, and thank you to our audience members who have submitted questions. We have a lot of questions. We'll try to get through as many as we can. Um, but let's welcome Randy and Denise back. Randy, you may want to take a drink of water. <laughs> um, so while, while you're doing that, I'll just ask uh, Denise, I think, a really quick question, which is, does Mastermind group other types of variants other than splice and intronic? Splice, intronic. Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, so in addition to the groups I showed uh, at the beginning on that slide, so groups like splice acceptor and uh, intronic variants, we also group together frame shift variants. So it would look something like, you know, H46FS to designate uh, a frame shift after histidine 46. Again, that refers to a group of variants, not just a singular change. So it might be like a a four base pair deletion that could lead to that H46 FS, or it could be a one base pair duplication also leading to that H46 FS. So both of those variants would get grouped together. Okay, awesome, thank you. All right, Randy, um, what in silico slice, I'm sorry, what in silico splice prediction tools do you use? So we use a in-house developed tool currently. Um, so yeah. Okay. Um, 
let's let's go on to um, are you able to tell why the APC mutant allele was contributing 98% to the transcript compared to the normal? If, if any of these questions need further consideration, we can we can. Put them yeah. In. So the mutant allele is not contributing. Uh, it's contributing two percent of the wild type transcript. Sorry, do you want to repeat that question? I'm not sure if I heard it correctly. Uh, yeah. Says, uh, are you able to tell why the APC mutant allele was contributing ninety-eight percent to the transcript compared to the normal? Yeah, okay. So it's um it's contributing 2% of the full length transcript. Um it would of course be contributing 100% of the skipped product. Um and I probably shouldn't say that. There could be normal skipping and I forget what those numbers actually are in that case. Uh but it it's contributing the vast majority of the exon skipping product and then only a very minor tiny portion of the full length product. So basically, that means that with the with that variant present, um, splicing is mostly happening incorrectly. Only on the very rare occasion is normal splicing happening. I hope that answers the question. Um, okay. Well, Bruno, reach out if uh, if you need okay. more. Um, all right, Denise. Um, someone searched for a splice variant in Mastermind. None of the articles have the crosshair symbol. Am I doing something wrong? <laughs> Right. Uh, the first thing to note is that the the crosshair symbol, bullseye, target, whatever we want to call it, um, the thing to denote those exact matches, that's a pro feature. So it's not available if you're using the basic edition of Mastermind. So that's one possible um, explanation there. Um, the next thing to do would be to make sure that you're searching for your variant using uh, the cDNA change. So when you type in a change, you know, like C.123, minus one G to A. When you type that into the search bar, you're going to get a drop down right under that. And it's going to suggest that exact nomenclature, the C dot. But you're also going to see the bucket as an option. So something like P dot R 41 S A maybe. So both of those are options to launch the search. But you want to make sure you're launching it um, as the cDNA because in order to get that crosshairs, you need to enter your variant you know, as a specific nucleotide change. So not as the bucket. Um, and then I guess the, the last explanation uh, would be that there really are no papers with, with an exact match for the change you're looking for. Um, remember that it's really easy to scan through those text matches to, to look at that, uh, specifically at the matched column. Um, so you can rule that out pretty quickly. Okay. Yeah, I was just gonna add, I, I feel like the vast majority of intronic variants do not have exact matches. So I wouldn't feel alarmed by that. Um, and like Denise mentioned, it requires a nucleotide change. So you can also search by genomic position and, and get those crosshairs too. So. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Randy, can dilution limited PCR be performed for all splice site variants to validate? And what other experiments do you suggest to confirm mosaicism of these variants? I'll read that again. If there's a lot. Yeah, can we use dilution limited? I mean, sometimes it can just be technically tricky to to get the dilution just to the right spot. Um, and some variants don't require uh, dilution limited PCR and allele specific quantification. So when you when you have a variant that abolishes the splice site. Um, you know it's not going to in any is it it's literally impossible for it to generate any sort of wild type transcript so a plus one variant or you know a plus two etc um that it's not even capable it can't somehow sometimes work the site is literally gone uh so those are cases where a little specific quantification quantification is less critical um what was the second part of the question it was oh mosaicism so from mosaicism, like if I'm, I'm not sure if that's what the person means, but if, if they're asking if the variant itself is um, mosaic, identifying that would require uh, doing like fiberglass testing or something like that. You would have to test 
cells outside of the, the blood sample and see if you're seeing the variant in any of those cells, some, not all, et cetera. So it would require that kind of additional testing. Okay, awesome. Uh, for Denise, apologies if I missed this. How often is Mastermind updated with new articles? Is it different for pro and basic? Yeah, great question. We update our database on a weekly basis, um, so it's very up to date. Um, and it's the same for pro and basic. You get access to the same information, um, whether you're using pro or basic. Awesome. And Randy, um, a question that, that could um, be pretty broad, but I'm sure you will make hay with it. What about the variants that have never been reported in the literature? Yeah, those ones are, are obviously uh, difficult. Um, we we because we have our internal RNA lab, so we're we're looking at the splice prediction. We also have experts who are reviewing the sequence for for all variants that have uh, a suspicious impact on splicing, and so that expert review and splice prediction. We often are sending variants. Uh, to the RNA lab for requesting samples, and we will investigate them ourselves if we uh, get a sample from the patient. So we do have that avenue for variants that aren't in the literature. And then we also have the clinical data option, but of course, uh, with internal clinical data, that, that does require time. So we can't, you know, when we first see the variant, we're not able to, to know what the clinical data is going to tell us later, but with time and more finds, we do keep an eye on that clinical data for genes where it, it's possible, it's not possible with all genes, of course. So we do everything we can, um, but yeah, it it is hard because most, most splice variants do not have literature. Okay, um, anything to add on that, Denise? Nope, not on my end, I think that was a great comprehensive answer. <laughs> Um, so, Denise uh, Constantinos asks, do you accept variants using the standard HGVS nomenclature? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we accept HGVS um, nomenclature in, in the search bar, uh, but there are a lot of ways that we are actually matching the variants in, in the articles themselves. So, we know that a significant percentage of published variants are described in non-standardized ways. So Mastermind recognizes HGBS um, and others, including you know like IBS nomenclature, like one-letter amino acids. So in the sentence fragments, you can see that in action. You know you may search something like R43X in the search bar. The matches that you will see in in the articles will include if authors are publishing that variant as like a cDNA change. Uh, as an RSID, uh, if they say like ARG43TER, um, and even some of the funky stuff like arrows and slashes, uh, those those kinds of things are picked up in the sentence fragments as well. Yeah, awesome. Uh, Randy, can you explain why or how your team modified the ACMG criteria? There's a few additional notes. Did your team take into account the new ClinGen splicing subgroup recommendation? from this year and how closely do you match those? We have uh, not yet taken any action to incorporate that very recent um, update for the, um, the modified tiering. And then we, so it's kind of, it's a lengthy, it would be a lengthy answer, but basically we are taking the information that we feel um, we feel has a high impact on classification, but we don't we don't. It's kind of our own our own recipe, I guess, if you will. For I'm trying to think of a of a good example of where we maybe differ. Um, for example, the absence of a variant in the general population, uh, we don't give that a lot of weight to say that a variant could be pathogenic. So we know that there are very rare benign variants, for example. So that's an example of one where um, maybe we would differ a little bit there. The other thing where like, we get specific in-house uh, rules would be like we have, we have rules for 
how common a variant needs to be before we'll downgrade it. Um, and that's not that it's not any different from ACMG. It's just, you know, we're applying our own little, you know, list of rules to that guideline, that particular ACMG guideline. So that's kind of what I mean by modified ACMG. Okay, awesome. Um, just two more questions. I think we can get through them quickly. This one for Denise is one I actually know the answer to. <laughs> Very proud. Um, what does SD mean in your annotations? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So SD stands for splice donor. Um, the image I showed in, in one of the first slides, in case anyone missed it, with the different groups, um, that's available in our FAQs. So if you're in Mastermind, um, you can go up to like the top right corner under help. In that drop down, you can get a link to our FAQs uh, straight from the application. Um, and the FAQs are also on our website. So you can see that image um, and, and kind of study all the different groups on that uh, in the FAQs. And you, we also have lots of videos showing how to use Mastermind um, on our resources page. Uh, one more question for Randy. Can other labs get access to your history weighting algorithm tool? And is that based on your own patient history data? It is based on our own history, uh, patient history data. And no, it, it's proprietary. So yeah, unfortunately, no. All right. Wow. Um, what a great group of questions, a great presentation. Thank you once again to Randy and to all of you for attending today. Um, here is one last look at that bit.ly link uh, to create your free mastermind account and a reminder to read Denise's blog on searching SNBs. Um, and of course, feel free to reach out to us with your questions um, to hello at genomenon.com. Look out for the link to the recording of this webinar in your email mail email inbox soon and hope to see you all again at our next event and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye. Bye.